Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, The Role of Co-Production in Recovery-Oriented Approaches to Mental Health. I would like to begin by acknowledging that CMHA, BC Division's office, is located on the unceded, traditional, and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I would also like to quickly credit our previous webinar presenters, Jenny Morgan and Vanessa Bursick, for the slides you see in front of you. Before we launch into the content of today's webinar, I'd like to point out a few features of the technology we're using and quickly run through the agenda. First of all, there are two options for sound. You can listen with your computer's audio or dial in by telephone. We have an international audience today, so you'll find two toll numbers, one for Canada and another for the United Kingdom. Please ensure if you choose the telephone option that you dial into the number for your location. You also have the option to switch from computer audio to telephone or vice versa at any point during the broadcast if needed. Second, we'll be recording today's webinar and posting the video online at getloudbc.ca, formerly known as beforestage4.ca, alongside a PDF copy of the PowerPoint slides. You also have the option to download the slides at any point during the broadcast or afterwards before closing the window. The file is located in the handout section of the panel to your right. If you're having pro problems seeing the slide at the present moment, you can go ahead and download it and then follow along um, during the webinar. Third, after the panel discussion, there will be an opportunity for audience members to ask follow-up questions. Please type your questions into the question section of your panel to the right. You can do so as soon as they occur to you. The sooner the better, as I'll collect questions throughout the webinar and read them out to presenters in the order I receive them. If you would like to address your question to any one panelist in particular, please make note of this in your submission. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible before the end of the webinar. The format of today's webinar is a bit different than before. Rather than presentations and a short audience Q&A, we decided to let you, the attendees, set the direction of the discussion and ask panelists questions that are important to you and your work. Thank you to everyone who filled out our survey and provided input. The number of responses we received and the level of interest conveyed was very heartening and inspiring. A core value of CMHA is not only to embrace the voice of people with mental health and substance use problems, but to work collaboratively with them to build a supportive mental health system that enables recovery in community. In the early 1980s, CMHA published a framework for support that articulates our person-centered approach and calls for recognition of and investment in the resources people need to be mentally healthy. These include community resources, or what is commonly known as social determinants of health, such as income, housing, employment, and education, knowledge resources that shape how individuals and society think about mental health, with variety placed on people's first-hand experiences of living with illness and accessing care, and personal resources such as the skills and capacities individuals already possess that enable them to recover, remain resilient, and be mentally well. This framework is evident in all our programs across the country, but it's best illustrated by those that seek to empower peers or persons with lived experience to design, deliver, and lead mental health supports and services in their communities. You'll see some examples listed on the slide. CMHA has a long history of traditional peer support programs where a person living with a mental health or substance use condition connects with another person, a peer support worker, who's experienced a similar challenge and has gone through their own recovery process. In some instances, these programs have been scaled up to become peer navigator programs, where peers or persons with a shared illness history provide guidance on when, how, and where to find healthcare and social services in their communities. We have also become involved with peer support certification. CMJ National has partnered with Peer Support Canada to roll out certification for peer support workers to confirm their knowledge, competencies, and experience, and put into practice a set of standards that ensure ethical and effective mental health peer support in a variety of settings. Lastly, Recovery College and Wellbeing Learning Centers, which are innovative learning environments where people with lived experience or peers Family members and mental health professionals work together to co-produce and co-deliver courses that support well-being and recovery. This is a newer initiative at CMHA that holds significant potential for system transformation and will feature prominently in our panel discussion today. As many of you know, the landscape of mental health and substance use supports and services in BC has started to shift in recent months. With the establishment of the new Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, an upcoming release of mental health and addiction strategies for adults and children and youth in spring 2019, 
there's considerable reason to hope for further involvement and empowerment of peers in service design and system reform. The gold standard of what we hope to achieve and what we'll be discussing in detail today is co-production. Before we go any further, I'd like to quickly propose the definition of co-production taken from UK's New Economics Foundation's literature review of co-production in mental health. Co-production is defined as a relationship where professionals and people living with illness share power to plan and deliver support together, recognizing that both partners have vital contributions to make in order to improve quality of life for people and communities. The diagram featured on the slide is called the ladder of participation and depicts different levels of involvement to demonstrate how co-production differs from traditional approaches to engagement or consultation and builds on previous service provider, service user dynamics. The first stage of the diagram represents traditional services where services are provided to educate and cure the people who access them so that they conform to pre-established norms and standards of good mental health. The second stage progresses towards greater participation but remains within clear parameters set by professionals and often only invites service users to be heard while denying them any power to implement their ideas or shape decision making. The third and final stage shifts power towards people and requires a fundamental change in how service providers work with service users, recognizing that positive outcomes cannot be delivered to or for people. Co-production involves an equal and reciprocal relationship where decision-making power is shared, people's voices are heard, valued, and acted upon, and peers empowered to take on service delivery roles themselves. The panelists who are joining us today are very familiar with this final stage of the diagram and actively work to put co-production in practice in their jurisdictions. Louise Christie is the Network Manager Operations for Scottish Recovery Network, a nonprofit initiative established in 2004 to promote and support recovery in Scotland and beyond. She leads a small team that works across sectors to support and share recovery approaches and learning and place lived experience at the center of health and social policy. A key aspect of her work is the development and delivery of the Making Recovery Real project that supports local agencies, organizations, and people with lived experience to work together to make recovery a reality. Laura Faulkner is the Assistant Director, Impact Mental Health and Wellbeing at Barnados a British charity founded to care for vulnerable children and young people. She is responsible for setting the strategic direction of the organization's mental health and well-being work and focuses her efforts on facilitating systems change through co-production and cross-sector partnerships. As a speech and language therapist by trade, Laura is passionate about early intervention, children and families at the center of service design, and evidence-informed innovative practice. Lisa Andrew Lacus and Callum Ross lead the development and delivery of Canada's largest recovery college at CMHA Calgary. Lisa has over a decade of experience activating programs in the charitable and private sector to serve people with complex needs and has worked in research, human rights and peer support her entire career. Callum began his career as a police officer in the UK and shifted into community services because of his passion for mental health solutions, advocacy, awareness and education. I'm so very pleased to welcome our panelists. Now that we're all in the same virtual room together, let's start the panel discussion. The first question is addressed to each of our panelists. Laura, we'll start with you. Can you tell us about your organization and your role there? Uh, yes, indeed. So I work for Bernardo's, and Bernardo's is the largest children community in the United Kingdom. Um, we exist really to transform the lives of vulnerable children and young people, and we have been doing this for around 150 years. Um, we believe that all children should be able to reach their potential, and what we do is support children from wherever they are with whatever challenges they have in life um, to achieve that potential. So we do work with very, very vulnerable children and families, and we look to try and achieve long-term solutions rather than short-term solutions for the challenges that the children and families are experiencing. Um, and we do this by taking um, a long-term approach that essentially means we are not just looking for sticking cut plaster solutions. So my role within the organisation as Assistant Director for Impact for Mental Health and Wellbeing 
um, as you said, is really to set the strategic direction for the organisation and to set the work plan for a 10-year period. So we're in a very fortunate position in the organisation in that we have investment over a 10-year period to look at what is it that we should be doing that's going to be transformational for children and young people. And by children and young people, we mean from pre-birth up to age 26. In the UK, we support young people up to age 26 if they have experience of the care system. So our services support children up to the age of 26. And in doing so, we very often are supporting parents as part of their recovery journey as well. So we're actually working with, with whole families as well as the children. So the, the, the task that I have is to consider what is it that we can do as an organisation that will be transformative um, for children and young people and families in terms of mental health and well-being, with a particular focus on prevention and early intervention. So really looking at what difference can we make with that 10-year um, investment. What we've got out of that um, focus is a programme of work that involves around 40, or will potentially involve around 40 projects, um, all of which are underpinned by an understanding of adverse childhood experiences, um, of developmental trauma, um, of a focus on building resilience, both within the child, the family and the community, um, and really on looking at how do we um, how do we extend our work as a trauma responsive organisation, and how do we develop new innovative work ways of working that are going to support mental health and wellbeing for children and young people in communities? So we have a particular focus on digital um, solutions, and um, we're going to try and focus on facilitating systems change. Um, within three strategic partnerships across the UK. So what we're trying to do is work in partnership with different organisations um, and different local authorities and NHS areas to bring about whole systems change for mental health and wellbeing right across that system within the geographical area. Thanks, Laura. I'll turn the question over to Lisa and Callum. Can you tell us a bit about CMHA Calgary and Recovery College? Hi, yes. Yeah, so, um, so I'm Callum. Uh, just to let people know, I do work in Canada, even though I think half the panelists are Scottish and uh, there's the token English person here, but we both work at Canadian Mental Health Association, Calgary region. So uh, I'll explain my role really quickly because uh, Lisa is the big boss of Recovery College. But the reason that I'm here today is that uh, I have uh, two uh, big pieces of my portfolio in Calgary. Uh, so I am the executive lead of um, collaboration uh, and peer support. And so what that basically means is uh, I am responsible for our peer support portfolio. And what's really important for us about that is that there is no, we, we don't consider there to be a recovery college without peer support workers. And so I'm blessed to have, um, I think we're uh, now at 32 peer support staff just in our local organization, which is really exciting since uh, just two and a half years ago, we had two. So uh, we've grown pretty quickly, uh, I think, because there's an awful lot of excitement in our province around Recovery College. And, uh, and so that's a big part of my role. And the other part is uh, the collaboration piece. So I am I'm the co-chair of the Calgary Council for Addiction and Mental Health. So just to give you some context about how the way mental health services are delivered in our province, uh, the vast majority of clinical and hospital-based services are delivered by our health authority, which is called Alberta Health Services. So those of you who are in the UK right now, that is our NHS. Uh, um, but the difference between the UK and uh, Canada, and I'm blessed to have kind of experiences in both countries, is uh, here in Canada, uh, the government has no responsibility to deliver uh, community-based uh, services of any kind, whether that be mental health or health. And many uh, health regions do choose to provide that, but there's nothing uh, in the legislation like there is in the UK that says that the NHS kind of has to go into community to provide service, which means there's a real gap for nonprofits uh, in our province to deliver community-based 
services. Uh, so, uh, so I am uh, a big bridge to our healthcare provider, uh, Alberta Health Services, uh, and we do a lot of innovative work together. So just to give you an idea, Calgary is a city of about 1.2 million people. Uh, and of course, we have Edmonton further up north. We work with very closely. They're about a three hour drive away. Um, but here in Calgary, with that just over 1.2 million people, we at last count, last count I did, we had over 32 nonprofits whose primary focus is addiction and or mental health. So it's a huge number of uh, participants in our community who are working really hard together to provide innovative services for, uh, for Calgarians who are looking to access health services. And, and the big, big difference that's kind of happened over the past few years, and I imagine it's very similar for the UK, is uh, the reason we kind of came to recovery college and the reason that we've grown so quickly and invested in our peer support services is uh, because uh, just the sheer volume of people who are now reaching out for help as our kind of experiences of stigma uh, decrease, especially for the under 30s. Uh, we've had to work really hard at different types of programs um, that we never had before. We were very used to supporting people in institutionalized models, one-on-one -on -one models, um, but we have seen our numbers just explode. So the, the one operational thing that I'm responsible for in our organization is what we call our welcome center. So that's attached to our recovery college and it's a way for you to drop in anytime you want without a referral, without a doctor's connection, without anything, just to connect with one of my peer support staff. I can fill email online or in person and we're open into the evenings as well. And the idea of that was that um, people were waiting in our clinical system up to uh, eight months for service. And, and we really wanted to strike while the iron was hot, especially with people who were experiencing kind of more mild experiences for episodic mental health issues. And we really wanted to have a population-based impact. So that's a little bit uh, of the background and the context of Calgary, my role leading the peer support stuff. I do want to point out that I don't identify as a peer of someone with lived experience in mental health. Uh, issues. Uh, I am probably the biggest cheerleader that will ever exist, and uh, I think that's always really important to acknowledge if you're doing co development work. So that's me. I can pass the word to Lisa, the big boss. So um, my name is Lisa Andrejakis. I am uh, the executive lead uh, of recovery and strategic initiatives in, at CMHA Calgary. And um, the biggest uh, part of my portfolio is um, the recovery college um, that we've built. It's the largest in Canada. And it really stemmed out of what Callum was just saying, which was we had an overwhelming need for services in our city and had to really rethink how we were gonna deliver those services to people um, in the community. And so um, when we were looking at kind of things that we could do and listening to the community response, recovery college model really fit really nicely with kind of where we were kind of looking at going. And so now the recovery college model really is kind of our next five to 10 year strategy of how do we take the model and expand it to um, anyone and everyone um, that wants to access mental health supports and services so really spreading across the continuum um, all the way from early intervention all the way into um, uh, complex uh, needs supports uh, for mental health. And so, yeah, I think that kind of sums up my role in what is we do here in Calgary. Um, oh, and this, the last part of my role is um, really working um, closely with the funders. Um, and I don't think you can underestimate that role um, that is needed when we're kind of building these services and supports um, as being a real champion of getting funders to understand um, the importance of listening to the community and community needs and really being um, their champion as well to say these are kind of services that the community is asking for. Great, thank you, Callum and Lisa. I'll turn it over to you now, Louise. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the Scottish Recovery Network and making recovery real? It, um, oh. Thank you. Um, well, I'm Louise. Um, I work with Scottish Recovery Network. We, as um, Amelia was saying, we were established in 2004, um, and we're a a non-profit independent of government, but funded by government. And um, we were established to promote and support recovery in Scotland. It was sort of early days and people were getting interested in recovery. We're a very small organisation. We still have under 10 members of staff. But what we've tried to do over the 10 years is, or 10, 15 years is raise awareness and, and, and get some sort of recovery movement going. 
We've done quite a lot of different things over the 15 years. Um, and that resulted about two to three years ago in a bit of a rethink about where we were as an organisation. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why um, I was, I'm was, i still here, um, is that I felt that at the time we were spending a lot of, a lot of our focus was on services. And there wasn't really enough focus on people with lived experience and their role in change and self-directed change. So the thing I'm talking about today, Making Recovery Real, was a, an initiative developed um, you know, three to four years ago, which we have learned a lot from. And as a result, um, we have established ourselves as an organisation with a mission to place the experience of recovery at the centre of life practice policy in Scotland. We believe that everyone has mental health and this is not about mental illness um, and that recovery um, from adversity of many types is an experience um, that um, needs to be shared. We work, we being a very small organisation, we only work with other people. So we say we work with others, um, people in communities, um, to help them reach their recovery potential, whether that's on an individual basis, um, getting people involved in groups and recovery movement, um, or getting involved in collaborative projects. We're also really much about sharing learning, but not in a way, oh, you do this, we did this, you do that, but trying to inspire people that change is possible, you can do different things, and that they can be part of that change. And everywhere we, everything we do is about putting lived experience at the centre. Um, I think that's our one unique um, as an organisation. I don't see other people don't do it, but that's one of the things that we can focus on because we don't deliver services. We don't have any particular statutory role. So that what we are all focused on now is how we get the voice of lived experience at the centre of things in Scotland. So see, I manage a very small team. I have one officer for the north of Scotland, one for the east and one for the west, and me for the whole of Scotland. So uh, the jam is thin, but um, in a way it's good because it helps us prioritise. Um, we focus very much on bringing people together around recovery, um, but also identifying collaborations where we can take things forward with people, um, give them a bit of a boost, help around self-directed projects in the community. Um, we promote um, the use of uh, our resources, such as the peer-to-peer -peer training manual, and we're developing more and more resources at the moment. We've got resources around recovery story sharing and conversation cafes coming out. And it's all about saying to people, here's a wee resource, you use it whatever way you want, but actually you're the experts. Um, and actually, one of the other things we've been doing is trying to share our learning with other people. Because one of the things that I have to be honest with is that a Scottish Recovery Network, we're often asked to contribute to seminars like this, and that actually many countries are much further forward than us. So maybe 10 years ago, people from Canada were coming to speak to us. You've been able to achieve change that we haven't in Scotland at a major level, so we have an awful lot to learn from you, because while we have this desire, we cannot talk about paid peer workers and recovery colleges in the way you are. So we have a lot to learn from you. So it's fantastic to hear about this. So lastly, I think for us, the whole thing about co-production is saying that it has to be about lived experience um, and listening to people, not consulting with them, but genuinely listening. And as an organisation, we try and model that by being honest that we're not the experts in recovery. Folk out there are. We have a responsibility to identify and nurture um, that, that expertise and to work with it and help people have their voice. So we don't really have the answers, but we are there to help people who do and can develop those answers and to give them the space and time to do that. And through that, we can help them engage locally and bring about the change they want to see. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Now that we have a sense of where you're all coming from and what your work looks like, we'll jump into the subject matter of the webinar. Um, as I mentioned earlier, but I just wanted to re-emphasize the questions that we're gonna go through are all taken from the registrants who filled out the survey. Um, so this is giving voice to you and community um, about what you want to learn um, and helping to kind of stimulate a dialogue between other jurisdictions and here in BC. So the first question I'm gonna to address to Laura what led Barnados to recognize and prioritize the knowledge and contributions of lived experience in devising and implementing their 10-year corporate strategy? 
Okay, so um, it's an interesting question that you raised like on, on the history of the Lardos. Um, so essentially, children and young people's voices have always been central to what we do as an organisation. We have a very strong policy and influencing aspect to our organisation as well as the service delivery work that we do. And we we do that policy and influencing work across the four UK governments. Um, and a lot of what we do in terms of our policy and influencing stems from what children and young people and families tell us is their lived experience within the service um, service that we deliver. And that can relate to anything um, that is related to our children and young people service delivery models. So, for instance, we will work with young carers, we will work with children with substance misuse, with children with mental health um, issues themselves, with parental health challenges. Um, we will work with many children who have experienced abuse or exploitation. So, whatever the, the vulnerability is that the children and young people and families have experienced, we work with the children and families to ensure that their voice is heard at government level. So it's really part of our DNA that we always do um, develop our service to the models by listening to children and young people and what they're telling us works for them and what they're telling us their experiences are. The only new strategy that we have is very much going to be underpinned by what children and young people tell us they want to see. Um, one of the things that, that happened several years ago was when we were looking to develop this new work within the field of mental health and wellbeing, <coughs> I undertook a, a survey with children and young people in Scotland around mental health and wellbeing and asking them, um, what is it that you want to see developed? Where is it that you go currently for support? Um, regardless of whether that support is at a very, very early stage, and um, regardless of whether that support is um, at a later stage in terms of need, what is it that helps and, and where do you go? And one of the really interesting things that came back from that survey was the diversity of views of children and young people as to where they would go for support and what they found helped. So, for instance, um, Many young people indicated that within a school setting, they would ask teachers or they had people within a school setting that they could go to for support when they were experiencing challenges with mental health and well-being. But equally, we had many children, young people, who said there was nobody within a school setting that they could go to for support. And what it led us to realise was that one size does not fit all in terms of developing some solutions for children and young people's mental health and well-being. And, and it really reinforced for us that professionals who were trying to do this in terms of developing new models of service delivery were not necessarily the best place to do this on their own. And we needed to listen to that diversity of views from children and young people. So we've got a, a service design process in terms of the, the strategic partnerships that we are going to establish within these three geographical areas. We have a very clear service design process that we will go through. And children and young people are obviously at the heart of that because our experience of service delivery, our experience of our policy and influencing and experience from, from carrying out um, surveys and speaking to children and young people has, is very clearly telling us that whatever it is that we do in terms of redesigning systems needs to be underpinned by um, children and young people's lived experience and not be around the professionals deciding what it is that, that needs to happen. So across the projects that we've got um, going on within the 10-year the sort of programme of work, we have these three strategic partnerships that we're forming um, where we are going to work with everybody within that local authority and NHS area. Um, so that could be police, housing, it will be other voluntary sector agencies, a wide, wide range of partners to look at what's working and to look at what's not working and very much listening to what children and young people are telling us and families are telling us is working and not working from a strength-based approach and then saying, well, what is it that we want to look to change? And out with those strategic partnerships, the other projects and the other pieces of work that are going on, some of those are digital solutions. 
Um, some of those are testing and developing new tools and resources, and all of them are done by listening to what children and young people are telling us um, they want to see and what those solutions will be for them. So as an example, we are looking at developing some new digital tools and resources, um, one of which will be a digital platform or an app. And we have already undertaken um, some work with children and young people around the early advice that they would like to hear um, related to anxiety and low mood. And, and one of the, the questions that we put to a group of, of young people who were in at the very early stages of that process was, OK, so are you wanting to see, um, you know, are, are you wanting written material? And the children told us quite clearly, no, we don't want written material. We actually want visuals. You know, what we use is Snapchat and that's the kind of content that we're looking for. OK, so do you want me producing information for you visually and doing podcasts or doing, you know, um, uh, visual diaries or anything that's telling you what to do to manage anxiety and low mood etc absolutely not Laura we want young people our own age who have lived the experience of the issues that we've got and who are slightly ahead of us on that recovery journey who can guide us through where we are now so what we're doing in terms of developing those digital tools and resources at every step of the way is working with children and young people to help us um, so that we are co-producing what we're, we're going to end up with through that service design process. So using very clear service design process methodology, but putting children and people and families at the centre. Whether that is within those digital solutions, any of the tools and resources that we're developing, any of the service delivery models we're developing, or within those strategic partnerships where we're looking at large scale systems change across organisations. Um, our focus very much is saying, let's start from what children and young people and families are telling us the issues are and start from what they're saying the strengths are and what they want to see. And then let's look at how we co-produce some of the solutions, test those iteratively, test those small scale to start with and see what works, what doesn't work have permission to test things and fail um, and then to, to constantly redesign with children and young people very, very much at the centre, sharing that power base with everybody that's, that's around the table in terms of getting to the solutions that we want for um, geographical areas across the UK. Thanks, Laura. Can you talk a bit about the factors that need to be present to shift an organization away from direct service provision designed by professionals and towards co-production? Um, okay, so I think um, I'm going to answer this in two perspectives. The first one is, is the organizational factors. So we are looking at this as Bernardo's as an organization, but we're, we're doing this way beyond the boundaries of just our organization. So one of the things that we did initially was look at what are some of the solutions for children and young people in terms of mental health. And we had lots of different things related to our existing models of service delivery. So we run a really good school um, based counselling service. We have lots of other um, models of service delivery that, that we provide across the four nations. And in looking at what some of the solutions are, it became evident very quickly from talking to, to our staff and our families and our children and from looking at the research, that these things in isolation are not the answer. What we're actually needing is that whole systems change in terms of um, beginning to look at mental health and wellbeing from a more preventative model and beginning to look at how services can, can join up rather than it being, you know, we want to put in place a specific service delivery model that, that's going to solve that problem for now, but isn't going to address the children and young people that are, that are coming up. So I think there are some similarities between what we would want within an organisation and what we would also be looking for across those systems. And I think the first one probably is that organisational ethos and the culture to work alongside children and young people and to be the voice of children and young people. And it's one of the things within the strategic partnerships that we are quite aware of. We're all starting from different perspectives on this. All the different bits of a strategic partnership come with their own experience of co-production and of 
working with children and young people and with a different understanding of what co-production actually means and what that will look like in practice. So I think, first of all, one of the real, really important factors is a fundamental belief that this is the right thing to do um, and that we need to share that, that power. And if you don't have that fundamental culture and belief within an organisation, then there's a task to do to start with before you then start to put in place whatever processes you want to have and structures you want to have to actually begin to develop full production. So... Bernardo's are traditionally a service delivery organisation and what we're trying to do within these strategic partnerships is move to more of a facilitatory role um, and what we've been able to do and how we've been able to do that really is around having access to voluntary funds and I think that's probably quite a, a crucial factor in being able to shift <coughs> excuse me, towards that co-production approach. We have um, we have a pot of money that comes in from our retail um, outlets, so our shops, and from our fundraising. That is a very very precious resource that's not necessarily tied to um, those contracts for service delivery. That means that as an organisation, we can say this is what we want to do, independent of what government or what um, local authorities or contracts are asking us to do, that allows us to consider, um, to step back and actually consider what does the research tell us, you know, what does the evidence tell us, what do families tell us, and to make decisions about what we want to do that based on that rather than based on the tender specifications from different contracts. So that access to that precious pot of money allows us to take the long term view and allows us to have um, the organisational commitment to do things differently and to do things over that, that longer term, which sometimes is what co-production leads to. We, we have to take time to actually embed those principles of co-production. I think there's something around the vision and having a very clear vision that is a shared vision um, across the organisations that we're working with. So um, that also involves having a shared language. And as a speech and language therapist, language is always very important to me and having, having that shared understanding of what it is we're aiming for, what co-production means and how we're going to achieve service redesign is really important. Because I can talk about service redesign and co-production, but if we've got people from from police and housing and other voluntary sector agencies who've got completely different experience of working alongside children and young people um, and who have a different perception of what co-production is going to look like and you've got children who've got a different perception of what co-production is going to look like then we're starting from from a different starting point so there's something really important about sharing um, that having that shared language and the shared vision of, of what this is going to look like I also think there's something important about understanding the starting point and the steps on the journey. So if we don't acknowledge that people are coming from different starting points on this journey, then we have an expectation that everybody is in the same place as us with the same shared understanding of the language and the tasks ahead of us. So I think it's important to take the time to explore what these different um you know, what, what the different principles of co-production mean and how we're actually going to do this in practice. I think the, 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 a shared understanding of the problem that we have around mental health and well-being and the potential solutions is really helpful because we have very different organisations coming together who are going to work on these solutions with very different perspectives of what their hotspots are and what their challenges are and what they think the solutions are. And we've got um, some universities involved in scoping some of that work for us and the evidence base that we'll, we'll use as a starting point. And I think the, the, the structured design process that we're going through um, will also assist um, with having that understanding of how the workshops will work and how we will facilitate co-production as part of, of the process. What's been really interesting, I think, is the, the having the space and the time and the permission um, 
to do this the, the right way and not to rush to solutions. So we're very clear that this is not a one-year plan. It, it's not a two-year or a three-year plan where we have to have solutions in place um, that we, you know, and we're coming into the process knowing the solutions. We're coming into the process not knowing what the solutions are and having that willingness to listen to those with lived experience who will help design what those solutions will be for that geographical area. And we're doing this in three geographical areas in the UK, and those solutions might be very different across those geographical areas, just because of the nature of the challenges that children and young people are experiencing locally. So we, we're, we've we got the space and we've got the permission and the time to actually do that. I think that's quite important because traditionally what happens is people have funding for one or two years, need to come to... Um, solutions very very quickly and need to jump to those solutions and start putting in place service delivery models and we've got we've got a bit of time around that which means it's an iterative process for us and we have hopefully have everybody on board thanks laura the next question is addressed to louise um who you similarly in the making recovery real project worked with different uh partners can you tell us how you got public and third party sectors involved in making recovery real and how you communicated the value of lived experience? Yes, well, I think similar to Laura, where we were starting from is there's no, nobody knows the way to do this. So we put out a call um, to people across Scotland to say, do you want to work with us to find out how to make recovery real, as wide as that. Because um, there was lots of people talking about recovery models, which is anathema to us and it was to me. But it was all, it, it just didn't feel that there was any willingness or openness. So it was very much, do you want to come together and let's explore what this feels like, means and looks like and get a wider range of people involved so that we get some, we know where we're going. So we're not doing more of the same. We're not tinkering with the existing. We're creating something new. And it was very interesting. So quite a lot of the people that we'd already been working with in the Scottish Recovery Network just couldn't respond to this at all. Um, but new people came all along and one of the areas was Dundee, we'd done very little work and what we found was that this was when third sector organisations really came to the fore and were saying we want to work with other people on this competition and the sort of structures you have locally stops people getting together. So we started with the willing, inviting people to come along, explore what it means and in Dundee, there was about 10 early adopters, and that included the council and the NHS who signed up. But I have to say, particularly the NHS really struggled to get engaged. What we did was we started off with these sort of 10 partners and we did a number of workshops with them just around how they related to each other, what was getting in the way, what was their vision, what would the, if they came back in five years and it worked really well, what they thought it would look like, what they thought could happen, what were their hopes and fears. And actually some of that process really allowed personal relationships of people who had sat in meetings for 10 years with each other to develop and they got to know each other as people. So we didn't treat people as representatives. We saw them as people. Um, one of the other things we found is that many of the people who got involved as practitioners also were very open very quickly about their own lived experience. And for them, um, and we've been doing a film about the experience of this, and this has been something that's been really striking, is that we now have people in fairly senior positions in the thirds and public sectors in Dundee who are now very open about their lived experience um, because the whole process has allowed them to be and given them, get, they've given themselves permission. So I'm saying that some people found it challenging to get involved. And what we did with that was we didn't stop. We sat with it, but we kept going. We kept the door open to them. We kept them informed. We kept inviting them. If we felt annoyed at them, we did it behind closed doors and did it to ourselves. Um, but we just presented this positive, friendly face. You know, you're very welcome. But there were certain times where we did say, you know, we're quite concerned about the reactions. We're quite concerned that people aren't getting involved. We think this is a missed opportunity. We also found that maybe, particularly with the NHS, we did have people involved, but they maybe weren't quite the right people. But we stuck with them because, do you know what, they felt lonely and isolated and they really valued being part of a recovery-focused 
collaboration, but they also helped us find who the right people were and helped get them on board. So I think you shouldn't be too worried about who. You get the right people and some of the rest if you keep going follows. And what we did find was that people were really keen to get involved in a collaboration around recovery not about mental health services, not about a provider's forum. So it was the recovery focus allowed people to set, step, take a step back from the competition and allowed them to focus on what they had in common and where their vision was going rather than the day-to-day. -day. So we really stepped aside of all of that stuff and, and provided that. We didn't stop any of that happening because this was additional. We also decided not to, as a Making Recovery Real Collaboration, respond to any consultations. Um, it's, which has been really interesting since we're all over the city plan and the mental health strategy and there's funding coming to all our projects. But by just being there and working with people, the local organisations founded much more of a cohesive voice. And again, that made that built relationships. I think in terms of lived experience, the people who, the willing partners who came along, the early adopters, the lived experience aspect of it was the thing that was really keeping them going, was the idea that, Certainly, lived experience needed to be far more central and we needed to rebalance power towards people with lived experience in the way we designed and delivered services. So that really helped. I think over time, the fact that people wanted to focus on sharing recovery stories and peer support, and we decided that we needed a product, we needed something concrete, and we created a recovery film, which there's links to in your handout. 20 minute film which is unscripted worked with over 50 people in Dundee 19 of whom appear in the film sharing their stories of recovery that brought in more people because it began to feel more mainstream it began to feel more possible and so you get to the point where having struggled to engage the NHS the uh, new associate director for medical uh, med associate director of medicine um, for mental health and learning disability came knocking on our door asking to talk um, and he's very keen because and he's acknowledging that the struggle to engage was because of uh, values and, a, and a, not a shared values base and they're moving towards that so I think having something to show so I wasn't just or me and the partners weren't just telling people about involving lived experience getting people along sometimes to events or using the film to show them what was possible and I think that's partly it, is showing people that it's possible. It's not necessarily scary. It takes you a wee bit out of your comfort zone, but also giving people the idea that by pulling together locally, they can achieve far more than sitting in their silos. Um, and I think for me, the whole idea of using recovery as a positive thing to get people coalescing around and to Set out the discomfort at times and just keep going um, really works. So for me, it's get the active people, get the early adopters on board, keep working, keep the doors open, but also sit with some of the discomfort because it's going to be there and just let it ride out. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. We'll move next to Lisa and Callum. Um, speaking similarly about recovery college and bringing diverse stakeholders together, how do you engage both peer supporters and students and professionals in co-developing curriculum? Uh, so I'll, I'll start. Uh, the, the one differentiation I do want to make uh, is between people with lived experience and peer support workers. So we, we make that different differentiation in Calgary zone. Uh, and so uh, so what's the difference for us? Uh, and how did we actually start on this recovery thing at anyway? Well, we actually phoned the Scottish Recovery Network four years ago, I think, looking for help. We were one of those people. And, um, and um, what we started four years ago is uh, myself, our executive director, our peer mentor uh, and myself we sat in a room every Friday and we said what the heck are we going to do about this peer support stuff like we know it's really important we think it's a way to make us really unique and I don't know if any other CMHAs out there or non-profits a lot of the time people don't really understand what it is we do they know what the NHS does they know what AHS does um, but what is it Canadian Mental Health Association is there for and so uh, thanks to our kind of terrific executive director kind of she said well peer support could be something to kind of differentiate ourselves and our understanding of recovery as well locally. 
Uh, and so out of that, we went and we spoke to about 250 people in the province uh, based on the guidance of the Scottish Recovery Network. And um, we just, yeah, we did the same process. We talked to people, we went on a traveling road show, we went to little tiny communities, 10 hour drives away. And we just said, we asked six questions. We asked the same six questions and the events were all peer led. Uh, and, um, and we got loads and loads and loads of responses. So Lisa actually wrote the beautiful document that I think was longer than your master's dissertation, uh, and uh, which kind of pointed things out. And so we had like three, three uh, main recommendations. We wanted to keep it simple for government and we've done it in partnership with our uh, NHS or equivalent of the NHS here. And they gave us, they said, you take this thing. This is something that we would struggle to do on our own. Uh, and so the main recommendation I want to talk about is uh, peer support or training. So that's how we differentiate between someone with lived experience and someone uh, who's a peer support worker. Uh, and, um, and basically, uh, yeah, we created a school uh, of which uh, we've had uh, 64 graduates, Lisa, and, uh, and another 35 are in the school right now. And that's something we're taking province-wide. And we're talking with national as well to talk about how do we actually take that to our other provinces in Canada. Because peers teaching peers uh, how to use their lived experience in a way to connect with one another is really important. And I think uh, a big thing we learned as well from that consultation process is you may be a nurse with lived experience and you can be a peer to other nurses. Um, but for you to wear both of those hats at the same time, really, uh, you know, uh, folks receiving mental health services told us that is not peer support. Uh, and I'm sure as professionals, we've probably all met lots of people and as peers who may have lived experience, but we sure as heck don't want them listening to other people or supporting them. And so, um, and so that whole process was evaluated and we did really well. We did it. A pilot process we made a lot of mistakes and there's two things I wanted to talk to that Louise and Laura had mentioned the first of all is uh, being vulnerable there uh, Louise with uh, with kind of the progress you've made that we found was incredibly important for co-production uh, and the principles is like we've made a lot of mistakes I think we've upset a number of people as well uh, but we've made some success and, and I've made uh, just just things you would not think of. We, I want to talk more about the practical stuff. So uh, when we first started our first class in last October in 2017, um, uh, the first thing we did operationally is we have what we call recovery trainers in a room and peer support workers in a room for every recovery college class. And, and me as the operations manager, I said, well, I've got money to create substitution teachers uh, should the recovery trainers be off sick. Uh, but I'm sorry, I don't have money for the peer support staff. So if you're off sick, I'm not going to replace you. Well, um, because co-production, co-delivery is a huge principle of ours, the staff said, well, that's rubbish. If, if, if we're truly talking about equality and we're truly talking about co-production, we don't care if your funder says they're not going to pay us if we're off sick. It is only equal to provide support and say that the peer support worker is as important as the recovery trainer that you know in the room. Uh, and so they were bloody right. I was wrong, and uh, that's something that I've got to be vulnerable with to say, you know what? Like um, these are things that we have to improve, and we have to be open to that criticism because I deeply believe that the reason we don't do co-production very often is because we don't like it when the community doesn't like the services we're providing. Especially working at charity, you know, I'm doing charitable work. You should be thankful for everything you get from me. Uh, and I think that is something as professionals we've got to kind of really do some self-exploration on. And say you know what I might not bring my best every day and um, but I know the clients are going to say they're satisfied 95 times out of 100 uh, and so we've really got to start looking at other things like experience and actually listening so um so I would say um that principle and um, we hammered out principles in our first few months with all of our staff they generated the principles with our students as well but we call them students and visitors visitors not clients uh, we hammered out principles together and it made difficult conversations much easier because instead of getting angry at one another using emotions or anything like that we just said well does this fit with the principle we created a year ago and, and then we're revisiting those principles to say you know are we doing a good job on them do they need to be changed uh, I think that is kind of the theory behind uh, behind the co-production piece. Lisa can be a little bit more real with what does co-production actually look like at our recovery college.
Yeah, so um, our recovery college, um, as Callum said, it's, we did a pilot of it in um, October last year and fully launched in May, um, well, actually two years ago, and now May last year is when we fully launched um, um, all of our services with over 40 offerings um, of courses available and the capacity to serve over 8,000 students. Um, what we, with our, what that enabled us to do was when we were first kind of creating our courses, we would talk to our peer support workers, people that kind of came into our services and built courses and ideas and generated um, all those kind of um, idea sessions together um, like that. And then as we grew and as Recovery College came more and more on board, our process now for co-production really is about um, engaging the community to tell us what is missing from our course time. What, what things do you like to see? What things do you not like to see? Even within the courses themselves of saying, you know, if if you were to do it again, would you? Is there certain areas that you'd want to spend more time on and less time on? And so, as Callum said, we have a welcome centre that is attached to our recovery college. So it's where anybody can come in, and they're greeted by somebody with lived experience, whether that be a, um, a person with their own personal experience of mental health or a family member. It's one of our family peer uh, trained peer support workers. And um, all of the services that happen in our drop-in and our welcome center are drop-in based. And so what that means is there's no commitment, there's no signing up, there's nothing coming along. Just come, attend, speak, don't speak. But the whole idea is that it's a safe place for you to come to. And um, one of our ideas that we created was we have this weekly group called Welcome Wednesdays, where it's just to kind of connect with other people and kind of get a sense as to what happens in our services. And um, it was at that weekly drop-in group, we decided to kind of put a suggestion box for individuals to say, what would you like to see? What would you want to see more of? And kind of give us the ideas for courses that should be um, should be designed. Um, we then also um, use our community relationships. So we go into um, different communities where maybe um, we don't um, see, you know, we don't have many people of different ethnic backgrounds and um and maybe um, gender diverse people coming into our center right away, but going out into those communities, connecting with the leaders, connecting with people in those communities to say, hey, okay, so we're, we're, not, we're not obviously creating something for you yet. Help us build something. We'll work with you. You give us the ideas and we'll, we'll start kind of packaging it up together with you and making sure that there is a voice for you at our, at our recovery college. And so typically what happens is we actually sit in our welcome center, wide open space with a big whiteboard that you roll in and we try and draw as many people in and we invite communities along and just say, hey, we're thinking of delivering this, um, of uh, developing and delivering this course. Like, what are your ideas? What kind of activities should we we throw in there what kind of things we, we love post-it notes yeah we love post-it post notes and white markers more the better like if we if we run out of whiteboard space we start writing on the windows i mean it's a brilliant session and what's great about it is people who not necessarily would kind of Kind of say I you know my voice is important actually start to kind of get drawn in because you can't you can't miss us we're right there in the middle of the center and we just you know you see somebody staring like hey what's your thought and you know you kind of draw them in and you ask them to come and join and then you have all these people sharing their knowledge and their experience and saying this is what I'd like to see or you know what I've been to sessions before where it's been been terrible because of x y and z so please make sure that those things are not in these courses because they're not helpful to me and then we offer people as well as saying you know if you're talking about creating an activity would you like to create that activity and bring it back next week and you know you go and create that activity and bring it back to us and we'll kind of we'll we'll support alongside with you but really really handing the content and the and everything back over to the community and then our job is really just to package it up and make sure it makes sense that it has the evidence attached to what it is that we're talking about that you know we we don't kind of go slightly offside and say all medications are bad and you know kind of go down that path but making sure that um anything that's kind of put out in front of people really comes from their voice thanks lisa and callum um if you're interested in seeing what some of the courses look like uh, attached in your handout section is the course prospectus from summer and fall 2018. So I encourage you to download that and look through it. There's also some really great definitions and FAQ around Recovery College. Um, and later on in the follow-up email, we'll send out the most recent version of the course prospectus, which is for winter 2019. 
The next question I have is for Louise. Similarly, looking at those co-production processes, can you describe one of your dialogue sessions where people living with mental illness and practitioners work together to identify supports for recovery? What I would start off by saying is that um, we didn't go straight to sort of co-design events that were very much about designing supports um, because people had just been used to being consulted on services. So the, this was part of a process and to go straight to that quite formal thing um, just didn't feel right. So we started off with... Um, you know, sort of celebration events, celebrate recovery in Dundee, watch recovery in Dundee. We used, um, we got people, we, well, we persuaded people to come along by in, inviting them to showcase their activities at their crafts group, at their hula hoop group, at their singing group. So we got lots of people with lived experience in the room and feeling it was their event because they'd run the morning. Didn't use any presentations, no high hygienes uh, heading it up. Um, we carefully design events for them to feel informal and welcoming. As somebody said to me recently, your, your events have a certain level of fluidity and organised chaos, but it always goes okay. We want people not to feel overly organised because then they can find their space. I, at the very beginning, when it was very much about it, Scottish Recovery Network, I tried to personally welcome as many people as possible. Um, and if people looked really nervous, I would make them a cup of tea, which wasn't so easy when those 80 folk turned up. They're not great at registering in Dundee, they just pile in. But it's noticing where people are nervous, and as time goes on, when you have a, a group of people who are involved, that you can say, oh, you know, Callum would be great for you to speak to and, and, and get people in and feeling comfortable. So we started off with very broad questions, like what would make Dundee a city of recovery? And the other thing we did was um, always ask people, and what do you want to do to help make that happen? So that led to very different answers. We then ran a lot of events, small events like drop-ins, that get involved afternoon tea, where people popped along for tea and a cake and had a wee chat about how they'd like to be involved and what that would mean for them and what support they would maybe like to be involved um, and the sort of things they'd like to do. So... We then identified a whole group of what we call table hosts. Um, and then we started on the sort of more formal co-design events, talking about what's important about peer support, other peer support events, and story sharing facilitator events. We use a lot of small group discussions. You can see the pictures there. We encourage people to doodle, to write, not just to write what they think, but to write what other people think. Um, um, we use a lot of these pictures to report back to people and it's lovely when people go, oh, well, you picked up my picture and, and you know, often they say more than a thousand words. Um, the Dundee City of Recovery, One City, Many Recoveries, is, has become one of the key things that we use. And actually people talk about that now. The other one, Dundee is a very small city on the River Tay. And um, leather is a Scottish word for talking. So we, we decided to call our, um, one of our events uh, Blether Together. Um, people, and because that was somebody's idea and people came along to that. We have wee ground rules that we developed with groups of people, which is about, and we have them in the tables, is about having fun, having your say, when you want to, but also we're not there to agree with each other, we're there to be curious and to listen, um, and always to make sure that people feel comfortable. So as well as group hosts, we always have two or three people, as they would in a contact centre, walking the floor, making sure that everybody's okay. If somebody's looking a bit uncomfortable, asking if they want a cup of tea and a wee step outside, um, helping people to move groups if they want to. But it's all very much about people feeling that their voice is the most important thing in that room at that time. And that also that they've got a real opportunity to listen to people. But I would emphasise that going straight to, oh, we need, to, we need to think about how services should be, so we need to run a co-design event. I don't think would have worked. I think the fact that we worked up to that with a whole series of events. So by the time we were doing that sort of event, people felt really comfortable in the environment. In fact, the people now at Making Recovery Real Events who struggle most are um, nursing um, and uh, allied health protect professionals, and they tend to need quite a lot of cosseting. But we have a group of peers who are wonderful with them. Um, but I think you need to be careful that you start your events on the basis where people are not the end point of where you want to be.
but make them fun. And you mentioned post-its. Do not underestimate the importance of things like shaped post-its, lovely different sizes of coloured pens, stickies, stencils, and a decent lunch. Thanks, Lou. Can I also say something about the, just quickly, we, we, we were very aware of the idea of hierarchies and not just in Dundee, but we do a lot of workshops across the country and we often don't have the time that we've had in Dundee to, to build up to it. So we always make sure we work intensively with partners. So I would hit the ground going around meeting all the partners and people talking to about the importance, gaining their trust so that they do bring along people. Because a lot of services get very worried about bringing people using their services or supported by them to events because they've had really bad experiences. So I do like, so when I started in Dundee, I lived there practically for two months and just smooched everyone and, you know, smoothed them. Um, so they built up that. We also, that makes sure that you get that balance where nobody feels totally in control, but people with lived experience feel it's different. We ask people to move things like name bags and badges and lanyards, and we model only having your own name on your name badge, but we, we ask people to personalise them. We also model behaviour, so I never introduce myself as Louise Christie, Network Manager from Scottish Recovery Network. I just say I'm Louise, one of the recovery people. Um, we also, um, at the beginning of a lot of events, use um, an exercise based around Mind Apples, which is a, an English charity. Um, and it's just a lovely wee, it's again, it's like a, wee, a lovely bit of stationery. It's a wee apple, wee apple, a bit of hemp string. But you ask people as an icebreaker to think about up to five things they do to keep well and to introduce themselves by their first name and one of the things they do to keep well. So it doesn't matter if you're the head of the Health and Social Care Partnership or you're like Louise Fay Kifkart in Glasgow, you're introducing yourself in the same way. And it's a real equaliser, but it also emphasises our humanity. And I think that's really, really important. And going back to what I said before, we worked very hard early on to identify a group of peers, which has got bigger and bigger. Um, they did not want to be facilitators, but they loved the idea of being a host. And I've learned the power of language because as a facilitator, it sounds very formal. So we have a whole group of people who are table hosts and group hosts and they welcome people. They encourage the conversation, but they're part of the group. So we've done a lot of training around being a, a group, a peer host. So they're part of the group, but they've got a responsibility. And having peers as the group host is, is a wonderful way to break down the hierarchy. Um, we did an event recently with mental health officers who are a very particular type of um, professional in Scotland who implement the Mental Health Act. So these are the social workers who get involved when somebody is, um, you know, is, is sent to hospital um, or they have to go or sectioned, as we would say it. And they all said that coming to these events was the best continuing professional development they ever had because they learn to listen with curiosity and to appreciate different perspectives. Um, so I, I do think that it is important to build up that because then people open up to actually listen. And I think that the events we've had have had a real impact because everybody feels a sense of buying into the results. And that's why things like we, we've, we were able to move from we should share recovery stories so we're making a film and this film will be shown everywhere and to, from we, peer support's important to, right, we all need to get together, we need to organise training, we need to set up a working group about who's developing peer roles, because we had enough people in the room to help make it happen. And it was very inspiring watching people like nurses who were saying, we'd love to do this, but we can't. Two hours later, go, oh, we didn't realise they were there and they could work with us and we can do this. Um, so I think it is important to create that and there's lots of little things you can do just to make sure that everybody's there as an equal and it takes a lot of thought so some people haven't liked taking their name badges off but we're quite polite but firm and usually they come back at the end and say you were right thank you it sounds like you can why it is it an environment um, to stimulate change? Can you identify one or two of the key findings that you have from the dialogue sessions? 
Well, I think the, the sessions that, that we've done have been around recovery stories. Um, and so one of the key things was that um, they needed to be much more of a focus on sharing recovery stories, because what they realised is that whole process of that and we developed a whole range of materials so that people can do it in a way that is manageable so we don't start off with what's your recovery story we ask people to think about their life as a film or um what's their superpower or you know letters from a younger self but i think that the whole point is that now in dundee there's an acceptance that actually recovery story sharing is not only therapeutic it's also empowering it's inspirational and that a lot of what we are doing these came to us seeing it as a sort of, oh, it's like consultation plus, but actually they're seeing that it's much more than that, that involving people and involving them in understanding their own story and inspiring others is good for people's recovery and people having a role and developing their role and being able to develop their role. So one of the key things is that everybody has agreed that they need to develop peer support a bit more. How they're going to do that is 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 yet to be decided, but one of the things that's happening almost on, that people have been talking about recently is in the past they've admitted they would probably have gone away in their organisations and sat down and looked at what peer support role should be in a role description or a job description, but is now they're coming along to make recovery real, they're developing a re relationship, they're getting groups of peers together and they're co-designing what the roles would be in their organisation. And they're starting not only from what they think they want, but from what people think would help and what people want to do. How revolutionary is that? So there's all these local organisations have been thinking about this for years, but didn't know how to do it. But they had people in their organisations who were desperate to do stuff, but didn't put their head above the parapet because their role was as a member or a service user. So we now in Dundee have a whole range of people taking the table host idea who are peer hosts in organisations. So they meet and greet, they talk to people, they follow them up, they help people negotiate around services with peer mentors. So there's all sorts of different roles have come out that are not, and none of them are one-to-one -one therapeutic services. It's all peer groups. Now, so I think for me, that's been the difference. It's not only it's encouraged people that this is the way forward, but that there is a different way to do it that makes it much more possible. Thanks, Louise. It seems that taking co-production approaches really starts to shift people's perceptions of what's possible. Uh, my next question is for Lisa and Callum. How has taking a co-production approach for Recovery College influenced other program offerings and shifted organizational culture at CMHA Calgary? Oh, here we go. Um, to be honest, I just, I don't know if you saw me vigorously nodding my head, Louise, but uh, so much of that stuff was exactly our experience. I can be really, really quick. Uh, just echoing your very first point. If you're interested in recovery, it's not a program. It is not a program. And if you think that you'll be able to put your agency uh, and just say, hey, recovery college looks good, or I, I, you know, peer support workers are in vogue. Let's hire a couple. It's not going to work. Uh, and um, and uh, you know, maybe I'll get in trouble for my boss from saying it, but like there are parts of our agency. Our agency is very large. We have about 150 employees overall. There are parts of our agency that are more recovery focused than others. And 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 it's not to say in a in a, a judgmental way. It's just in a you know where they deliver their services, maybe how they're funded, uh, who their partners are, uh, and so it's an ongoing process and, and and to be honest to even what we found now now we're a year and a half in to even keep what we've got we now know is actually a pretty big challenge because everything changes people's roles change new folk come on so this constant education uh, for people is really, really important, especially leaders. I think lead, if, if the leaders are on board, when you said that uh, professionals are sharing their experiences in Dundee, I was like, that's brilliant. That's the beginning uh, because people are actually willing to be a bit vulnerable. Um, so that that's really my point. Uh, and yeah, we've actually banned the use of lanyards in our agency. Uh, we call them the new white coats. And so they're gone. So if you're caught with a lanyard, it's a three-day suspension. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really important to say that um, 
going back, I think, as Callum said, the peer support really has become the thing that is in vogue about saying how do we create um, peer support as a role, as a way of um, creating sustainable employment and opportunities and kind of bringing that along. But I think too much of the time, the focus has been on the peer support workers and peer support as a movement and forgetting that actually the most important thing is the recovery aspect, because if you can be recovery focused and use your recovery principles and be in the, and, and, and look within that, that's what makes peer support successful in, in workplaces. And so when we talk about um, organizational readiness, and uh, we talk about workplace readiness for peer support and a lot of people think that's workplace readiness for the peer themselves and saying are they ready to go into a workplace and not be re-stigmatized and re-traumatized and that's a whole other conversation that we have with them they're really about saying it's about the workplace being ready to accept peer support workers into their team and being a recovery focused organization that the mental health commission did fantastic research years ago now that basically you know two pieces the number one reason peer support or recovery will fail and a workplace is not because the staff member will burn out it'll actually be the workplace that burns them out uh, it's not because of their own existing uh, challenges with mental health it's because the workplace themselves does not want to be challenged right now and doesn't value that equality and and sometimes some workplaces can't do it again so it's not a judgment it's because risk tolerances are very low uh, potentially the culture of that organization so again you know i think we're quite jolly people we're quite resilient people but it's not always been fun we've had some really critical conversations we've had some really big arguments and we're not there yet but i would say yeah for us now we are trying to get to the other side of that recovery and we've got about i would say uh 50 members now of staff in our team uh, keeping it recovery focus is actually really hard and uh, because things do become more process driven they do become more operationalized uh, and uh, sometimes you know the bureaucracy sometimes swallows that human uh, recovery focus piece so we've got to work really really hard on keeping what we've got thank you so i have one final question that i'll address to all of you what is the most important consideration for building capacity and meaningfully empowering people with lived experience to become involved or even lead change efforts laura i'll address this to you first Is under, I think what's important is understanding the dynamics of the system that you're working within and where both the professionals and children and young people are and what capacity needs to be built where. So are you talking about building capacity within children and young people to have confidence and self-esteem and, and the ability to participate in what you're asking them to do? Or are you needing to build the capacity in the professionals in understanding um, you know, the, the complexities of the power ball imbalance and, and how they um, need to look at a co-production approach. So I think the important considerations in building that capacity are around the shared vision and the language and understanding um, the, the impact of power imbalance and looking at how organisations need to shift culture. So what we're trying to do within the systems change is establish a sustainable model that we can then walk away at the end of this long period of time and it is sustainable. So in order to do that, we need to do the building of capacity within the professionals and within the children, young people and families so that this can be sustained, that those um, that understanding is there and shared, the vision is shared um, and the, the structures and the processes are in place to actually sustain um, that co-production approach. Thanks, Laura. I'll turn it next over to you, Louise. I mean, I, I agree with what Laura is saying. I think we've also got to be really mindful of our starting point. Um, you know, where are we? Because I think in terms of capacity, we've also got to think about our own. Um, it's something that I've learned is that um, I'm doing a leadership course at the moment. Apparently, I'm quite an activist and I'm very driven. But I have to remind myself that um, that it's not my drive that's important. It's the way I use my drive um, and activism to help other people get where they are. So um, I think it's really important to have a very open agenda um, and, and to give people that space. And as Laura says, be really aware of the fact that capacity is, is quite 
uh, is usually it's seen as building community capacity. Uh, communities have capacity. It sometimes doesn't fit very well in the structures. So sometimes you have to build communities confidence to engage, but also you have to work to change and provide alternative structures where they feel more comfortable. And then on the other side, you've got to work with professionals um, who feel comfortable in their structures and not so comfortable outside and get them moving in. I think what we've tried to do in Dundee is some way of a halfway house. Um, I think the other thing is, I was once told that what we were doing in Dundee wasn't always co-production because not everybody was in the room at the same time. And that wasn't appropriate. There was times when we needed to have difficult conversations with people and you shouldn't have them in the room with everyone else to make that happen. But there's other times where you needed to facilitate that getting together. But I think it's about sitting down and looking at generally where you're going and thinking about what sort of um, experiences people need to grow into this because they're not going to be trained. Um, as an aside, the Scottish government has done co-production training for all the civil servants. And um, apparently um, the all basically feedback was that this is really nice stuff and they think everybody else should do it, but they're far too busy to do it themselves. And essentially that's what we were told. So you have to give people the experience to grow into this. This is not something extra. This is a change in the way we do things. Um, so I would say, finally, Look for leadership properly. Leadership is not always positional. Leadership, and we found in recovery, leadership comes in very interesting and exciting places. And you might not have the ideal person of the ideal status, but we found people who've helped us bring about real change. So be aware of the fact that there's capacity there. You just need to find it and unlock it sometimes. Thanks, Louise. Now, Lisa and Callum. Um, I think uh, both uh, Laura and Louise have like really fantastically summed up kind of what our beliefs are around building capacity. I think, um, you, yeah, you've answered kind of both kind of the ideas that I was going to say. I mean, CMHA, we've always seen what we've been doing as a systematic change, not just a program that has been developed for a community and leaving it like that. I think we've always seen our um, our role as being you know, how can we build something that will actually create system disruption and and cre and create that wider change uh, for for the mental health community. Um, I think uh, equally as well, it's that piece of um, not tokenizing. People people of making sure that there really truly is um a voice that is um, heard at the table and make and like you say building confidence confidence is completely underrated when we first started doing co-development sessions with people kind of saying you know tell us what you think and they're sitting there going well I don't know what to think you tell me what I should be thinking and telling you and you say well what do you think about this yeah that sounds good and it's really saying no what is it that you truly want and believe and so that confidence building um, really cannot be underestimated um, I think going back to kind of um, you say it's the professional versus the individual um one of the funniest uh funny and good not good way um we're talking to a clinician who said i totally believe in co-production but you've got to remember that co-production includes a clinician too and it was saying absolutely value that piece it absolutely does but getting a clinician in a room is so less hard than getting a peer and people with their own experience in a room to speak up and to voice kind of what it is they want so really um, putting that value back on the individual and doing what it takes to build the individual and a community up together to then come forward with a solution for themselves because if it's not a solution built by them it's not gonna it, it, it doesn't go very far and for me, the most important thing, uh, and I, I can get quite personal with my answer, I think it's a, it's acknowledging your own privilege. So I like, um, the only time I've ever used my job, uh, uh, my job title is for this webinar, I think. Uh, I'm a white male who's immigrated to Canada, who had no problems doing that. Uh, you know, I lead a large team. And so every meeting I'm going to go into, I've got to acknowledge that straight away, people are going to, you know, we're programmed to ask, where is it you are on the hierarchy, you're the big bosses, and you're going to have the most influence to change. And again, uh, echoing Louise's point, uh, I've done a lot of um, government relations in my time, and uh, we're not allowed to say a lot of stuff as a nonprofit, um, but our students sure as heck can. And so, and especially as we build their confidence, they should be saying those things because it truly does affect them, um, but they've never really had permission to do that before. So I think, um, yeah, really 
this equality stuff is really easy to say, and especially a lot of us with community backgrounds, we love saying we're very equal and we're very good at this. I think as leaders, as we kind of acknowledge our own privilege and how that kind of impacts the services we deliver, I, I think uh, is, uh, is a really fun personal journey. Uh, and then the last piece is um, these are really fantastic jobs we all have i personally believe that and uh, it should be fun right like finally we're improving i think uh, mental health services especially kind of in the area i work in now uh, that have been kind of doing the same thing for a heck of a long time and we've been able to disrupt a heck of a lot of stuff really quickly that's really really exciting so i think on those hard days when you think you haven't made very much progress uh, those little celebrations uh, obviously uh, they kind of keep you going because it's it's not easy work but i think it's really fun work Okay, thank you. So now we have a little bit of time left for audience questions. Um, if you do have a question, please type it into the question box. It appears on the right on your panel and I'll try to collect them as quickly as possible. Um, to get us started is, is kind of a practical question. I'm gonna address it to Louise. Um, how do you reach a common definition of recovery and of lived experience in order to assure that, that everybody's kind of talking about the same thing? Oh, this is this is this is a. I think this is an ongoing um, issue, particularly in our organisation. Um, I'm not big on very specific definitions. Um, I just uh, somebody was pointing out to me today. I'm not not really big on big plan. Well, I like plans as long as I've got lots of holes. I think that we can get overly worried about definitions. So even in Scottish Recovery Network, we have a fairly accepted definition. We've adapted it recently because we felt it was just a wee bit long and boring. Um, but essentially, we always say, I always say to people, you know, your recovery is yours. You talk about your recovery. So to give you an idea about recovery, so when we started in Dundee, one of the big issues that the original partners coming together, a collaborator said, was that they didn't feel they were all on the same page on recovery. Um, so we had a lot of chats about that. And about a year or so later, um, we had a sort of partners get together about where were we going and what was working, what wasn't. And I asked them about that and they said, do you know, that doesn't seem so important now far more people are involved. And we have people with lived experience talking about their lives. And actually, it's not what we think recovery is that important. It's what they think recovery that's important. So I do think there's something about accepting that recovery is, 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 is of the self and is, is largely self-defined. So you cannot tell somebody they're not in recovery. You can be curious and interested in their view of recovery. And you can have your own. And you can maybe say, hmm, that wouldn't be mine. But I think we have to stop this idea of imposing definitions on people. In Scotland, that's one of the big differences between addictions and mental health. There is still somewhat of a script on recovery and addictions about um, uh, abstinence and about the time abstinent. Um, but I think in mental health, it's really important. We also have a lot of discussions around lived experience. And again, I think it is very much self-defined. And when you create the environment that we have, say in Dundee and in other places where we've done similar work, it seems to become less important because people then feel that it's a positive thing and they can go, well, this is my life experience, it's not yours. And yours is really, really difficult, maybe I'm having my difficult times. So there's space for everyone. When I first got involved in the Scottish Recovery Network, there was people saying to me, you don't have lived experience, you've never been in hospital. I have to say, they didn't know anything about my life. They made a lot of assumptions about me. Um, so I think for us and for people at me, say, you know, I do have my own lived experience. It hasn't included things like formal mental health services um, and hospital, but I have had, um, I have used services. I have very difficult times. Um, I've learned a lot from them. Um, I'm also still a struggle at times, but I'll be honest about that. So I think for me, it's about having that open dialogue and about allowing people to be what they want to be and stop because the whole lived experience thing makes it makes me think of eligibility right and nobody should be eligible for recovery or lived experience let people be what they are let the conversations be curious um and and, and let those happen so in dundee people are starting to self-select for the things they're interested by saying well that looks really interesting but you know what my experience is more about that so i think you should let that happen and not impose on people I'm not saying everybody agrees with me, but this is what's working. Thanks, Louise. One more quick question. This is for Lisa and Callum. 
how does CMHA Calgary fund the Recovery College? Lisa's money back, so I'll let her uh, answer that question. Um, our, the way we fund our recovery college has been a journey, um, and um, and I think we have been really lucky with um, our context in Calgary that we have uh, a lot of foundations that are willing to kind of jump on and support new initiatives, um, which basically is how we started uh, doing our recovery college. We kind of got some seed funding uh, for um, from some grantors and um, and and kind of kept joining um, pockets of funding around this one idea to create this kind of large one uh, one to two year pilot program of saying how can we build and create this um, through through doing that we also um, one of our uh, funders United Way um, changed up their uh, their entire kind of uh, mental health portfolio and what they were willing to fund and the recovery college fit really nicely and so we went to them and asked them whether we could repurpose the funding that we were getting for one on one case management support and say you know, could we realign it under this recovery college model and um, kind of through our initial findings that we got from these grants to say, can, can we now kind of change our funding into, into this model? And then um, through that, then started talking to our other more sustainable funders to say, look what we've built, what we've created, look what we can achieve. These are the impact and outcomes that we've, we're starting to see. Um, is there an opportunity again to have a conversation with you about realigning and repurposing our current funding um, and basically taking existing um, existing pieces of our um, that we already had at CMHA and re reimagining and repackaging them up into a recovery college. Um, our next two year plan is to replicate results from the UK. So um, we actually work very closely with the South, uh, Southwest London Recovery College, the first recovery college. And um, we are actually uh, using one of the grants over the next year to replicate their results. Uh, and so that question that you get from every grantor in the world, how is your project going to be sustainable? The way we answer that is through evidence and impact, not through getting money from someplace else, uh, because that's not really how not-for-profits work. And no one wants to tell you that. We run on a three to five year cycle. That's how all money works uh, for us in Canada or in Alberta anyway. And so our sustainability is to prove to you that this is having a vastly huge impact in comparison to any other ideas. So. Wonderful, thank you. So we're a little bit over time, so I'm just gonna wrap things up. Thank you again to our panelists and everybody who joined the webinar today. A quick mention before you sign off, you'll find a short survey in a pop-up window when the webinar concludes. We'd greatly appreciate if you'd take a minute or two to fill out the survey. Your feedback will help us design future policy webinars that are of interest to you. So that's all from us. Thanks very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.